Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel H&E Life and I'm Dr. Cindy Wong. Today I want to talk about pathology fellowships. I have listed here all the pathology fellowships that there are. Pathology fellowships are broken into AP, which is anatomical pathology, and CP, which is clinical pathology. Under both AP and CP, there are both ABP certified fellowships and non-ABP certified fellowships. The ABP fellowships are the ones that require additional boards to be taken after the fellowship is over. So let's go over this list. Under anatomical pathology, the board certified fellowships are cytopathology, dermatopathology, forensic pathology, neuropathology, and pediatric pathology. The non-certified ones are basically all the other subspecialties of surgical pathology, which are breast, thoracic, GI, GU, gyn, medical, renal, bone soft tissue, and general surge path pathology fellowships. Under the clinical pathology, board certified fellowships are basically all of them. The blood bank and transfusion medicine, chemistry, clinical informatics, hematopathology, medical microbiology, and molecular pathology. The non-certified ones are immunology and coagulation, and these are actually two fellowships that are not offered very commonly. Only a few programs offer these. Most fellowships are one-year fellowships. The only exceptions are dermatopathology, which is two years, neuropathology, which is two years, all right, so that's the list of fellowships, and I just want to now go over some of the timeline. In pathology, fellowships are found basically two years in advance of graduation. So if you are APCP four-year track, you will start applying for fellowships at the beginning of your third year. If you're AP or your CP only three-year track, you'll be starting to apply for fellowships basically at the beginning of your second year. This really doesn't leave you much time in terms of in two years to impress and prepare, but I will go into some tips later in this video. So basically you want to start preparing for fellowship applications in the late spring of your second year. By preparing for application, you will want to update your CV with any clinical activities or research activities. Uh, you also will want to uh, ask your letter writers to start thinking of writing your letters. After you have your application ready, most places don't open their fellowship application process till basically July. So basically your first month of PGY3 year is the time you apply. For example, July 2021, you are basically applying for a fellowship that is going from 2023 to 2024. It's pretty far in advance when you think about it. The only exception to this July start they will be forensics. My understanding is forensics, they start in uh, their application acceptance around March or April, so super early. When I say March or April, I mean March of April of your second year. So basically when I would say around when you should start preparing for your uh, application, if you're interested in forensics, you would want to start probably in the winter. Once your application is in, you will probably get your interview invites in late July through mid to late August. This way the programs can get accumulation of applications and only interview the few that they think will qualify. Once you schedule your interview and you go on your interview, usually afterwards they'll let you know if you have an acceptance or a rejection within two to three weeks of your interview date. Okay, so that is the general timeline. I wanna now dive deeper into the application process. Unfortunately for pathology fellowships, there is no common application, which is a big bummer because that means every program you apply to will end up having their own application process. Some are online portals, some are still like paper, which you fill out and you email to a coordinator. So this means it's really hard to apply to a ton of fellowships because you have to fill them out all individually. Me and my co-residents, we end up averaging applying to about six programs. We will do our research um, in terms of, you know, program's reputation and where we would like to go and then kind of just narrow it down to you know, six programs. If you feel like your application is a little on the weak side, you probably want to apply to a little bit more and more broadly. And when you're searching up 
programs in preparation for your application, you also want to look at the application requirements. Different programs have different requirements and you want to make sure you are able to get all of them. When you're preparing for which program you want to go to, you also want to check to see um, if any of these programs have a specific hard cutoff uh, deadline. For example, when I was applying to MD Anderson, they had a specific cutoff deadline in the very beginning of July and they said they will not take any late applications. So double check to see if any of the programs you're interested have such a thing but i think most programs are very flexible in terms of your letters of recommendation uh, most programs ask for only three letters and some programs will allow you to upload up to six letters my tip for your letters is that quality is much better than quantity you don't want to have six weak letters of people who will just say oh this person was a good resident and be very generic you ideally want to get letters from people who you've worked with extensively um, and who can write a good letter saying how well you've worked how you've contributed to the program and things like that it's very similar to anything you never want to ask for a letter writer if you think they will not be able to write a very good letter for you or if they have anything negative to say. So not all of your letters have to be within the subspecialty of the fellowship you want to apply to. Uh, for example, I applied for GI pathology. I had two letters from senior GI pathology faculty at my institution. And then I also got a letter from the department's AP chair. And then I also had a fourth letter, which is the program director letter. And that's one of those letters that every program requires. And basically a letter where the program director says, you know, you are of a good standing and you're not having any difficulties. In addition to your CV and your letters, you also need to write another personal statement it's more like of a cover letter, but it's it's a personal statement about why you want to go into the subspecialty fellowship that you're choosing to apply to. And honestly, it's not that important. I think at this point in our careers, most people don't really care about that statement. Lance is grammatically correct and that you express interest in the subspecialty. I think you could write almost anything there and it'll be okay. The last thing that you want to make sure you get is uh, you have official copies of your step one through three reports. So now that you have your application ready, you have your letters, you have everything updated, and you have applied to your programs starting July, you would then uh, start hearing back from programs for interviews around late July and through August, you want to try to schedule as many of your interviews as close together as you can, because since there is no common application and there's no match system in pathology, offers are basically first come first serve kind of situation. So the reason I say you want to schedule your interviews as close as you can to each other is because in case you have a program that is your number one choice to go to for fellowship. If you can, try to schedule that first. If not, try to schedule that as close to the beginning of your interview process as possible. For example, the first place you interview at is not your first choice and you interview there and you're like, okay, this is a program that you know I wouldn't mind going to. Within a week of your interview, they give you an offer. You have about a week to maybe two weeks max to tell them, yes, I want to come to your program or not. And now you're at this kind of a fork in the road where, well, you could say no and hope that you get your interview for your top program uh, soon or risk the possibility that you might not get to any program at all if you turn this one down and you get no more interview offers or you get no more uh, acceptance offers from other programs you interviewed at. So this is the downside of no match is it kind of puts the pressure on the applicant. And sometimes this pressure doesn't always end up having good results for the applicants. It's more favors the programs because they will put the offer for the, the resident that they want. And then now that resident have to decide, well, do I want to say yes or do I want to, you know, risk it and keep trying. And once you say yes to a program, you really want to make sure that they give you a sort of signed official letter. Uh, it doesn't have to be your contract. It just needs to be a signed letter from the program director and the department saying, yes, we have offered you a position for the year that you're applying for before you start telling other programs no. 
and withdrawing your application because if you only have like an email saying oh yeah we would like to offer you and they never and then you say yes and they never follow up that's that email is not official so you want to make sure you get something written and signed before you start retracting your application and telling other places no. And here are some questions that I feel like um, my junior residents have asked me. If I want to do a subspecialty of surgical pathology, for example, I want to do a breast fellowship, do I need to do a surgical pathology fellowship beforehand before I apply for the subspecialty? And the answer is no. It used to be in the past when everyone was still signing out general uh, services where you sign out a little of every Thing where you should do a general surgical pathology before you subspecialize. But now, especially in academics, if you want to subspecialize in one field of pathology, that is how they hire you. They will hire you if you want to do a breast fellowship, they will hire you as a breast attending and you will only be signing out breasts. And then that leads into another common question I get asked is how many fellowships should I do? So the answer is most people do one or two fellowships. If you do more than two, if you do three or more fellowships, most employers look down on that because most would make the assumption that you couldn't possibly have that many interests in different parts of pathology and you must have done a third fellowship just because you couldn't find a job at the first time you were looking for one so that's why most people do one or two and honestly there's already so much knowledge in each subspecialties it's highly unlikely that you'll be able to master more than two subspecialties within pathology within my graduating year majority of us are only doing one fellowship only two is doing two fellowships it's really up to you especially if you're going to academics you won't need to do two subspecialty fellowships unless it's two that you really are interested in and you cannot imagine not you know signing out that subspecialty whereas if you go into private practice setting or community practice doing two fellowships might be beneficial especially if you combine two that are very thought after such as if you combine a subspecialty with say cytology that's usually one of the more <laughs> popular choices for people who are going into private practice or community practice settings. So other common questions I get a lot is, do I need to do research to apply for fellowships? It really depends on where you're applying to. If you're applying to a place that's very academically driven, then you will definitely need to have some sort of research project under your belt. So for example, if you want to apply to MGH or Brigham, then you for sure will want to do at least a project or two, have an abstract at a conference like USCAP. You really don't need a ton of projects you just need to do maybe one or two projects that you're interested in doing a bunch of projects is really difficult because you're having to do it while you're still working as a resident so it's very busy pick a project and a mentor that you enjoy working with because if you just don't like the project you're working on it's going to be very hard to find motivation to keep going at it the other thing i could suggest that will help your application is to try to schedule your second year so you can start signing out more of the subspecialty that you're interested in applying to that way you can work with those faculty more so they will be able to have a better judgment of you and your work ethic and all of that so they can write you a more personable letter and the reason i made this video was because i felt like when it was close to time for me to apply i really didn't get much like direction from my uh, residency program about how to do all of this so a lot of this was basically word of mouth from my senior residents so i felt like i should just do a video to cover the same things that i was curious about for everyone else whose program doesn't also do a good job telling you how to apply for fellowship all right so that's it for now please like and subscribe and bye